Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, well, a little story about my nightmare experience writing booklet notes for RCA's Basic 100 series. You asked me for the story, because I sort of let drop that there was another story in there somewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so here I am to tell it to you. Well, once upon a time, there was a major label called RCA. RCA has lots of stuff. This was before all of the mergers and demergers and remergers and unmergers, before they became part of Bertelsmann's, which became part of Sony. It was, it, or maybe it was when, was when they were part of Bertelsmann's. I don't remember exactly. It was about, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago when the Basic 100 series first saw the light of day. Um, I had been writing booklet notes for them off and on for quite a while, you know, and in those days, you know, th you know th things were very, very different. They really were. I, you know, there was, they were different in the way they dealt with the press. All they did, they had a press person. In this case, her name was Marilyn Eagle. She was the most lovely person in the world. She sat in a little office with a bunch of filing cabinets full of promotional stuff. And when you wanted something, you just called her up or you could go over there to say hi because we all like to visit her because she was so nice. And she'd just say, here, <laughs> have things, go ahead and, you know, do what you want to do. And that was it. It, there was no attempt to control the press. There were no heavy-duty PR people trying to push the message. It, you know, they knew they had great artists and they were content to let people say what they wanted to say. And, and it was really very, very pleasant in that respect. So I have to give them credit for that. Of course, that didn't last. And Marilyn Eagle was like near retirement for the last 30 years that we knew her. So she eventually left and, and we loved you, Marilyn. So I just want to make that point. Anyway, um, there was a guy in charge of what they called secondary exploitations. He was had a title. He was a producer, something. I don't remember his name. He was an incredible dick, just a jerk. And he was in charge. And the people, by the way, who are in charge of secondary exploitations quite often are fairly obnoxious. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's because it's a dead end. They regard it as a dead end job. And it, there's a certain inferiority complex associated with it. And because in order to secondarily exploit the catalog, they actually have to know it and listen to it, which they don't want to do at all. Most of them come from, in the big labels, most of them come from pop music backgrounds. I mean, the one exception, a really good exception is Cyrus Mayer Holmji, who runs Universal Australia, who does all those fabulous Australian eloquence boxes and series and all that stuff, who's just terrific. And there are wonderful people at major labels who work in the archives, who do these, you know, the, the guys at Sony now who are doing all those big boxes and things. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they have long, long histories with these labels and they know what they have. But the people on charge, the executives who are doing, you know, the the trying to make money, let's put it that way. They're quite often just awful. Well, this was one of those guys. And so we had an initial meeting. They asked me to do it because they, they knew my work and they liked my work from some of the previous productions that I had been involved with. I'm trying to think of what they were. I'd done some notes for um, T Tim Urkanoff's New York Philharmonic recordings, like pictures at an exhibition and stuff like that. Scheherazade, I think I did. And, and so they asked me if I would be interested in working on this new project. So I had a meeting with this guy, an initial meeting. And, oh, it didn't go well. I mean, they hired me, but I had, I had my, my, my concerns, let's just say. And the concerns were as follows. First of all, he says to me, we're going to do this reissue series. It's called Basic 100 for beginners, for rank beginners. And I said to him, okay, well, if you're going to do... Uh, basic anything for rank beginners, you're about 75 discs too many. Nobody is going to buy 100 CDs. It's just too much. The basic repertoire is actually very small. I mean, even if you're doing Beethoven symphonies, you could get away with doing like, you know, five and seven or the Eroica and one other, and that's it. And then you do, you know, one, uh, you know, a Brahms and, and a Tchaikovsky and, and, you know, a Bach and a Mozart, and you know, you, you pick one from each of these people, and that's it. And you have tw a total 25 D CD series. You could package it all in various ways, but that's what your basics are going to be. I said, nobody will do the whole hundred. 
it's just impossible. And so he said, well, I don't care. We're doing 100. I said, and I said to him, and I want to have some say in which repertoire you choose and which performances of that repertoire, because I know what you have. He's like, no, no, we're doing that. You don't need to do, get involved in that. I said, OK, that's lovely. I said, then I want a contract to do the whole series. I said, because if you want me, he wanted me to design a format for the notes that all of the subsequent releases would use um, and to, you know, have a certain, you, you know, pr put a proprietary stamp on the whole thing. So I said, okay, I'll design the format, I'll do all that stuff, but I want a contract to do the whole series because, you know, you're asking me to do quite a bit of work. And he said, no, we don't give contracts. Absolutely not. We'll just pay you per note. I said, oh, that's going to go well. Mm -hmm. We'll see how far we get, won't we? So that was where we left it because I, I had no say, I had no authority and no, no leverage. I needed the money. It was freelance work. And so that's what, that's what we did. So we started doing, you know, I, we would do them in rafts of like 10, I think, five or 10 releases. And as usual with these things, it started like gangbusters. It started to slow down. I don't know if they ever got to 100. I don't think they did. I think they gave up in the 70s. The whole thing sputtered to a halt. But we had a couple of disagreements along the way. And the big one was over, over Peter and the Wolf and Britain's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, where I wrote a very nice liner note, which they really didn't like. They didn't like it. They said uh, it was much too musically involved because they said I was being... You know, I was talking too much about the music, and it was a children's disc. And I, I said to the guy, and we just had this big argument over it, and I came in to meet with him over this, believe it or not. And I said to the guy, well, it's not a children's disc. He said, what do you mean it's not a children's disc? It's the young person's guide to the orchestra and Peter and the Wolf, and Peter and the Wolf has David Bowie narrating it and you know, Eugene Ormandy conducting it and all that stuff. I said, yeah, but kids aren't buying them. It's part of the Basic 100 series. Whoever is buying this stuff is buying the Basic 100 series. Oh, well, it has to appeal to both markets. We want it to appeal to the market for children's CDs. I said, well, the market for children's CDs is parents. It's not children. Children aren't reading booklet notes. Parents read booklet notes. And they're not even going to see the booklet notes unless they buy the CD. So how would they know it's for kids or not for kids in the first place? Well, none of those arguments went over. He, we had a big disagreement. I said, I'm really not inclined to rewrite the notes. He said, well, we're going to get somebody else. I said, okay, you're going to get somebody else. Go ahead, get somebody else. So they got somebody else who did something, I don't know, whatever it was. I don't know whether they used it or didn't use it. I didn't look or whether they used my thing or they didn't. I didn't worry about it. But at that point, and we'd done like 40 some odd titles, I think, um, they said they did not want to use me anymore but that they would use my format and they would use my notes and all of that stuff. And, and that was that. Was that. Um, so I figured that was the end. But in the meantime, certain somewhere down the pike, uh, I saw that they had been reusing my notes in other releases that were not part of Basic 100. And so I called this guy and I said, hey, listen, jerk. I said, you can't do that. I said, you don't own these. I own the copyright in my notes. You don't. He said, oh, no, we do. You were a worker for hire. We own the copyright. I said, yeah, you would have if you had a contract. But you wouldn't give me a contract. You wouldn't specify that it was a work for hire, that you were purchasing the copyright, that you had the rights to it in perpetuity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, without that, I said, I spoke to a copyright attorney, which, of course, I did. I said, I own those notes, and you are forbidden to use them unless you make a deal with me to pay me for the use of them. So um, I don't know whether they continue to use them or actually stopped using them, but uh, they illegally stole them essentially and uh, didn't pay me for the other uses that they put to them. And so I, I think that they stopped. It's needless to say, I did no more work for them from that point on and I was not unhappy at doing no more work for them. But this was a, a typical experience dealing with sort of major label infrastructure. Independent labels, people like that were great. You have never an issue. Of course, they couldn't pay anything, but they were very nice. Major labels were always, always, always uh, an issue. 
they had so much attitude and they did they had tremendous economic wealth because of their pop music divisions and and tremendous clout in the industry they had the distribution networks and they had no clue what they were doing and this was just one small example with which i was associated there are some others that maybe you know, i have talked about some previously and we can talk about more in the future possibly but that was that was one of my most uh frustrating and irritating experiences working with a major label. So I hope that you've enjoyed this little tale from the salt mines of the classical music industry. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.